How are we doing, everyone? More evolution with Glenn coming right up. We now are up to unit two. Unit two has a big focus on what I call Darwin's definitions. Okay, so there is an article that I wrote that you have read for today called Darwin's Definitions, and it has a lot of the basic ideas or the basic concepts that you will need to understand the material from this class. There are a lot of concepts there. In the syllabus, or the outline for this class, I talk about your creative product that you will do with your team and you will, in the last couple of class periods, you will present your creative product. In the past, students have done amazing creative products and I'm really looking forward to your work. Um, one of the parts of the assignment is to use 10 of the concepts in this article. There are about 30, so you can choose. So use about 10 and bring them into your project somehow or another. Um, so the article, Darwin's Definitions, is a very important part of the reading and the material for this class. There are a few specific definitions that we will be going over. One of them is a very big idea um, that might not even be in the list of definitions, but it kind of is over all the definitions, or many of them, and it's called evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology is essentially the idea that human behavior is the product of evolution. Human behavior is the product of evolution. We already started talking about this a little bit. Um, in the last class period, I talked about human emotional expression. Okay, example. Human emotional expression. The idea of human emotional expression as being an adaptation is part of the idea of evolutionary psychology. The idea of evolutionary psychology suggests that any mental processes so any mental processes including thoughts, feelings, motivations, can be thought of as adaptations. And what is interesting about evolutionary psychology, this idea that mental processes might be thought of as adaptations, is it expands across species. So this expands across species. Um, I will give you one example. In a 
non-human species. I'll tell you something about mice. Mice automatically run to dark areas and the edges of a room in the presence of cat urine. Um, this is a finding that makes sense. It has been demonstrated in a lot of studies because cat urine has a very strong smell and mice have a very strong ability to detect chemicals in different smells. And if you have two different mice and they both smell cat urine in the natural world, and one of them goes to the edge and hides, but the other one runs into the middle of the room and smiles, the one that runs into the middle of the room, dead. So that tendency, that behavioral tendency for mice to go to the edges when they smell the presence of a cat is an adaptation across Thousands of generations of mouse evolution, mice that went to the edge and hid in the presence of a cat were more likely to survive and they were more likely to reproduce. That idea of a behavior being the product of evolution is evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology is any example where a behavioral pattern or a mental process can be thought of as an adaptation, as the product of evolution. One of the concepts in Darwin's definitions that relates to evolutionary psychology is the idea of what is called sexual selection. Sexual selection is kind of like natural selection. In fact, it's part of natural selection. But what's interesting about sexual selection is it is when a feature of an organism evolved not to survive, sometimes it hurts survival, but it helps with reproduction. So it hinders survival but it helps with sexual reproduction. Okay, here's a classic example. So something that evolved because of sexual selection, which is like natural selection, it is some feature of an organism that hinders survival, it stops survival, gets in the way of survival, but it helps
helps with sexual reproduction. An example, or the famous example, the peacock's tail. Okay, so a peacock is a famous bird. Um, I think they largely live in India. I don't know if they naturally exist in China. I know there's a lot of big mountains in between. Um, but a peacock has bright feathers. And those feathers famously have a lot of colors. What is interesting is the peacock is male. The peacock is the male. It has fancy feathers. So in this kind of bird, the male, or the boy, has fancy feathers, but the female, called peahen, no one seems to know that word, but peahen, the peahen does not have fancy colors. So uh, here's my pea hen. Poor pea hen does not have fancy colors. But the peacock has very vibrant, rich, what are called conspicuous colors. They stand out. They are very, very visible. Charles Darwin once said, I'm going to have to erase my name, kids, to get this point across. Charles Darwin, who wrote about this many years ago, said that the problem of the peacock kept him awake at night. The problem of the peacock kept him awake at night. What does that mean? Why would Charles Darwin, who developed the idea of evolution, who developed the idea of natural selection, think about the tail of the peacock and be so upset that he could not sleep at night? Here's the answer, or here's what made Charles Darwin upset. He came up with his idea of natural selection. He thought characteristics or features of organisms that become species typical, that are found in all members of the species or in one sex of the species, the males or the females, he thought that they were something that helped survival and that helped reproduction. But there's a problem with the bright tails. The bright tail of the peacock hinders survival because of tigers. So this was the thought that Charles Darwin had. He said, wait a minute. In India, in 
the jungles of India, there are predators. A predator is an animal that eats other animals. And one of the scariest predators in the jungles of India is a tiger. And tigers eat peacocks. So think about that bright tail. From an evolutionary perspective, the bright tail is kind of strange. Because just like mice evolved to get away from predators, right? You would think that all animals would evolve to get away from predators. But the bright tail of the peacock is what we call conspicuous. It is conspicuous, meaning it is loud. It is hard to miss or hard to not see. It is almost like an advertisement. It's like a loud advertisement to predators. Bright peacock's tail is kind of like saying, look at me, here I am, tigers, right here. And you would think that natural selection would say, would stop any feature of an organism that got in the way of survival. So this is why Charles Darwin didn't like peacocks, because their bright tail did not make sense to him in terms of his ideas of natural selection. And one day, I don't know the particular story, but one day he came out with a new book. And his new book was all about what he called sexual selection. So this is often considered Charles Darwin's second big idea. sexual selection. A feature of an organism that comes about by sexual selection has come about not to help with survival, but rather to help with reproduction. that helps with reproduction but maybe not with survival. So some feature that does help with reproduction but it does not help with survival. Sometimes it gets in the way of survival. So his big idea regarding the peacock's tail was that maybe the peacock's tail evolved to attract females. And it turns out that he was absolutely correct. And this is true in a lot of bird species. Um, if you know bird species where the male and the female have different colors, so like here in the United States, there's a cardinal, and the male cardinal is a bright red, beautiful bright red. 
And the female cardinal has a little bit of red, but is mostly tan or brown. But the male is bright, bright red. Um, in lots of bird species, the male is very colorful. The peacock is a very extreme example of that. When we see bird species where the male is very colorful compared to the female, it usually means that the coloration, the bright colors in the males evolved because females are more likely to select brightly colored males as mates. So Darwin's big idea regarding sexual selection is that if something evolves in one sex, males but not females, or females but not males, but it becomes very common in that sex of the organism, that usually means that members of the opposite sex have a preference for that particular feature. In lots of bird species, including peacocks, Females are more likely to choose males with a bright coloration. And being selected as a mate leads to reproduction. Or being preferentially it increases the probability of reproductive success. Remember the other day, I said that reproductive success is Darwin's bottom line. What ultimately matters from an evolutionary perspective is whether some feature helps to increase the likelihood of reproductive success. And reproductive success is actually more important than is survival. If you had a whole bunch of birds and some of them were good at surviving but not reproducing, and some were okay at survival, sometimes they got eaten by tigers, but they were really good at reproducing, the ones that are better at reproducing will be more likely to exist in the future compared to the ones that were good at surviving but not good at reproducing. So that is the puzzle of the peacock's tail. The next concept from Darwin's definition, Darwin's definition that I really want to elaborate on a bit, is called parental investment theory, and it's highly related to this idea of sexual selection. I just gotta keep this guy up there. I can't help it. So parental investment theory was developed by another very important um, evolutionary scientist named Robert Trivers. Robert Trivers, he's still alive actually, a little bit older, um, but he, uh, he came up with a lot of really important ideas that took evolution and applied it to behavior. Parental investment theory is a really powerful idea. It's kind of a basic idea, but it's very powerful. And before he developed this idea in the 1970s, prior researchers did not have a good understanding of it. He essentially came up with this idea. So he, um, he essentially said that the mating system in a particular 
particular species um, is related to the required amount of parental investment to successfully raise offspring to adulthood. Okay, I'll read that again for you. Parental investment theory is this idea that the mating system in a particular species is related to the required amount of parental investment needed to successfully raise offspring to adulthood. There's a bird that we have, it's probably very similar. I, I know, remember students tell me they don't have them in China, but it's a very common bird here. Um, and there are similar birds. It's called a North American robin. The North American robin is very cute. Um, it's famous for having a lot of red. On its belly. And the robin is very common. Um, where we live, we see nests for robins every year. They will be next to the house, um, on the front of the house, on the back of the house in the trees near the house, um, they're everywhere. And what I love about the robins is they work very hard. They're famous for that. Um, a robin will have a nest. And in the nest, there will be usually about three or four babies. babies are helpless. Baby robins are helpless which there's another term from Darwin's definitions which is that robins are an altricial species. Robins are an altricial species. They're like humans. Our young are helpless when they are born. The baby robins are helpless when they hatch out of their eggs. They have this beautiful blue egg, light blue, it's a wonderful color. And when they hatch out of their eggs, they're helpless. If mom goes away, they're not gonna survive. They need parental support. Any species where the young are helpless early on in life are what we call an altricial species. Robins are very altricial. The babies need a lot of help.
That's what altricial means, that the babies need a lot of help. So, who am I going to draw? There he is. You know who that is, students? That's that. So there's mom and dad. Here's something that I find about robins. Robins are busy. After the babies hatch, the robins are so busy getting worms. So that's what they get, is worms to feed the babies. So all day long, if you're bored at our house, you can look out into the yard and you will see the robins going to get worms feeding the babies. They eat worms. That is their primary nutritional sustenance. And because the babies need a lot of food, the mom goes out all day long, the entire time that it is sunlight, so from about six in the morning to about eight at night, they fly from the nest, they go to the yard and, and dig up for worms, they bring a worm back, they give it to the babies, they fly out again, and they come back, and they go, and they come, and they do this for about two or three straight weeks. About 20 days. It's very busy. They're very hard workers. And like any big job, the mom, the mother, cannot do it herself. She needs help. The babies need help. If there is only one parent, they don't get very much help. The babies are more likely to not survive. If there is more than one parent helping, like the dad, the babies are much more likely to get enough food and they are much more likely to survive and to ultimately become adults themselves. The cost, the way that Robert Trivers talks about it, he says that the cost 